Welcome to this author interaction of the 2022 NLF Reading Challenge. My name is Sneha and I'm very excited to be here. We hope you are too. Before we begin this interaction, do allow me to give you a brief introduction to the NLF Reading Challenge. I will follow this up with a few housekeeping rules for today's session. The NLF Reading Challenge is a four month long reading event from March to June, 2022 for students between 10 to 13 years of age. It runs for students across India on the competitive and the non-competitive tracks. In addition to fun book-based activities and regular author interactions, the challenge will conclude with a quiz competition that will see the three best teams win gold, silver, and bronze engraved trophies respectively, certificates of achievement, and a great set of books. For today's author interaction, please use the Q&A box to type out your questions or your responses to what's being discussed during the session. If you're a student, a teacher, or a school librarian, please mention the name of your school along with your question as well. And today, we are privileged to have with us the wonderful storyteller and writer, Kwame Mbalia. Kwame is a husband, father, writer, and the New York Times best-selling author. His debut middle grade novel, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, that he'll be discussing today, was awarded a Corita Scott King Author Honor 2020, among other honors. It's a part of the Tristan trilogy. Tristan Strong destroys the world and Tristan Strong keeps punching all bestsellers in their own right. He's also the co-author of The Last Gate of the Emperor with Prince Joel Makonen and the editor of the number one New York Times bestselling anthology, Black Boy Joy. Kwame, I watched an interview of yours in which you said, when you introduce yourself, when you give someone your name, that's the very first story you will tell them. And so I welcome you by asking you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, um, I did say that. And I firmly believe um, that your name is the very first story that you will tell anyone. It gives your lineage. It gives your heritage. It gives your history and the hopes and the dreams um, that were bestowed upon you when you enter the world. So my name is Kwame Mbalia, author, uh, father, uh, pun master, dad joke extraordinaire, uh, if I do say so myself. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you, Kwame, for the fascinating introduction. <laughs> Welcome again. <laughs> we are very happy to have you with us today. Um, would you now want to begin the session by reading from the book before we move into the Q&A segment? Yeah, so uh, whenever I do any sort of um, school visit, I love doing readings. Um, and I usually uh, read this particular section from Tristan Strong, Punches a Hole in the Sky. And um, I read it for two reasons. And I'll, and I'll tell you why after I do it. It's a, it's a shorter segment. Um, <clears throat> I have to do voices <clears throat> because it introduces um, a character that when I wrote her, I didn't realize how much of a fan favorite she would be. But it introduces the character of Gum Baby. Um, and so I'm going to read this small scene from, uh, for you and, and then talk about why it's important afterwards. <clears throat> In the Anansi tales, Gum Baby was a doll Anansi used to trap an African fairy while he was on a quest. But in the story, the doll remained silent and wore leaves for clothes. This one, on the other hand, had on a black turtleneck and black pants, but her tiny feet were bare. And what were those stains she was tracking across the floor? <clears throat> hey, Gum Baby's talking to you, big boy. The doll marched across the floor. The serious expression on her face ruined by the plopping sound each of her footsteps made. Don't make Gum Baby climb up there. Plop, plop, plop. Is Gum Baby talking to a brick wall? Plop, plop, plop. Oh, you're asking for it now. Plop. Plop, plop. 
She was up the side of the bed and leaving dark stains on the blankets. By the time I finally shook myself out of the daze and extended the flashlight like a weapon. Who, who are you? I whispered. The 10 inch dog glared at me, climbed atop my foot and struck a pose. Both arms spread wide, one foot planted on my big toe. She laughed in her tiny voice. <laughs> you wanna know who Gum Baby is? Gum Baby is the reason you sleep with the door locked. Gum Baby is the reason the sun runs away across the sky. Gum Baby is your nightmare and people whisper her name and tremble around the world. <laughs> Shh, I said, waving both arms in warning. You're going to wake up my grandparents. Gum Baby cocked her head and looked at me like I had just slapped her. Did you, she began, did you just shush, Gum Baby? Didn't you hear the introduction? Being the nightmare and all that and you locking your door? Did, did that not make sense? No, it made sense. It's just, should Gum Baby clarify? No, 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 it's fine. I just don't want... Oh, good, good. In that case, Gum Baby will go upside your head if you ever think about shushing her again. Gum Baby scrambled across my lap and flailed at my chest with both sticky hands. Let another shush come out of their mouth. Let it. It'll be the last shush your shush maker will ever shushify. So that's that's the the scene that I usually start off reading. It gets, you know. The kids uh, get excited. I get to do voices. Everyone, it's a win-win situation. Everyone's happy. But the reason that it's important is because that is actually the very first thing I ever wrote when I sat down to write Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. It is the very first um, scene, dialogue, little bit. I just knew that I wanted Gum Baby, a tiny, sticky little character, to break into this room. And that sets off a chain of events. Um, but what I love to tell young readers and young aspiring writers is if you pay attention, that scene doesn't start until page 29 in the book. Yes. So even though it's the very first thing I ever wrote, it's not the first thing in the book. And that's because we decided we needed more. Gun Baby steals that scene, but this book is about Tristan and his growth. And so I love telling young writers that even you may write something the first time and it may be great, but it may not be what's best for the book. And so we revise we revise, we edit. Nothing that we write the first time is ever perfect, no matter how great we may think it is. Thank you, Kwame. Love the voices. Uh, it was, <laughs> I agree with you. It was extremely a win-win situation. <laughs> um, but what you said leads me to the first question. Um, what sets Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky apart from all the other fantasy adventure books is this underlying theme of stories. You mentioned that your parents exposed you to the stories of African-American gods and West African folk tales, and you wanted to take these tales forward. So I'm very curious to know, how did you set about developing the story of Tristan? It's so brilliantly interspersed with snippets, characters, and stories from these folk tales. Uh, did you start with Tristan's stories and weave the folk tales in, or was it the other way around? Or was it symbiotic, both parts developing together? Uh, so I knew that I wanted to do two things. I knew I wanted to tell a story about stories, right? Um, and I knew that I wanted to use, you know, the, the folktale uh, characters, the folk heroes and heroines and gods and goddesses um, and creatures that I grew up reading and listening to, right? I wanted to bring them forward for a new generation. Um, and so really my style of storytelling really suited this story very well in that I'm the type of person that, you know, I'll start, I'll start telling a story. And then I realize that you need this backstory in order to understand this story fully. And then there's this joke that really fits in really well and ties it all together. And it's sort of like um, a spider web uh, that radiates outwards, right? And it's all connected. You have this story here and here and here. But at the center is this arc, this growth arc for our main character. And we realize, you know, somewhere in the, maybe in the middle of the book, you know, smart readers might not like myself. I'm not a smart reader, but other smart readers might recognize it from the beginning. Some people it might, you know, take all the way to the end, but they realize that all of these 
you know, supplementary stories, all of these tales, all of these folk heroes and gods, they all have something in common with the arc that our main character is going through, right? And Tristan Strong, we, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on it in a little bit, but in Tristan Strong, the main theme is grief, or this main theme is this idea of loss, right? And if you pay it, I didn't realize this until I was going through it and, and I realized my subconscious might have been speaking through. Um, all of the characters that Tristan runs into, is, are, they're dealing with loss of some form, right? Um, the, the, the mid folk, the people of mid past, they've lost their homes, right? They've been forced to take refuge in the thicket. Um, the sky god, Jinyame, right? He has lost his people and he was forced to watch them be taken from him, right? Tristan has lost his best friend. Um, there's this idea of loss that permeates through all of the stories and characters um, and we weave them together and we realize that um, different people process it different in different ways. And for Tristan, it was important for him to recognize that um, something that I tell people all the time when, when I'm traveling around and I'm talking about grief and loss in that, you know, a lot of times you'll hear, oh, you know, you should just get over it. You can get over it. But you don't get over grief or loss. You get along with it. Sometimes it takes, it occupies smaller real estate inside of you. Other times it grows, right? But we don't get over it. We move on with our lives, realizing that we have to get along with it. And it's almost a partnership. Um, and so it was really important when, when telling this Tristan story that we have little bits of connecting stories that reemphasize how different people experience loss. Thank you. Yes, that's very true. And so uh, that leads me to ask, is that why you said in one interview that it takes a lot of strength to punch through the sky? So was there something more to the title than you know, just the plot? I mean, it's one, it's such a, um, what's, what's the word? Almost ludicrous title. Like it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense at all. Right. Which is the point, you know, the point of a title, um, even before sometimes you see the cover, if you think about traveling through a bookstore or a library, right. Trailing your fingers along the spines of the books as you try to figure out what you're going to read. Titles are the first thing that catch your eye. And so when you see some, you know, Tristan Strong punches a hole in the sky, you're like, what, this, this is physically impossible. How does this manifest itself? And so you're curious. Um, but yes, it does take a lot of power, right? And if you think about, um, I'm always wary of, of spoilers, but if you think of how Tristan punched a hole into the sky, he didn't do it by himself, right? There was, he was um, in a battle with someone else, right? Um, and they were also, there were two, not just one, there were two, um, I guess we'll call them magical objects in the scene as well, right? There were, so there was a, a Tristan, there was Gum Baby, we had Eddie's journal, and we have the bottle tree, right? All of those combined in a moment of anger and grief at what we were afraid we were about to lose, all of that combined um, in one, you know, right hook uh, to punch a hole into the sky. So it wasn't, it wasn't just Tristan, but Tristan gets the blame for it. You know, he gets the accolades for saving the day, but he also gets the blame for it. Yes, that's true. And uh, I think that's what was the most gripping part of the story. It starts with a bang, literal mm -hmm. bang. And it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Shristi from Neve Academy and I, both of us were wondering about Nana. I mean, Tristan's mm. grandmother, Nana, if one wanted to eat. And I love that line there, by the way. There was an amazing line. Um, she's the source of stories for Tristan and Eddie. Um, and Nana is, of course, a very important character of the book. And she gets more screen time on the pages in the sequels of the Tristan trilogy. Um, for you personally, you said the source of your stories were your parents. So who did you base this character of Nana on? Nana is, is uh, two things for me. Two, uh, she represents the grandmother, um, the matriarch, um, 
one of um, the most important figures in, I, I would say, in, in global cultures, uh, but also in, in African-American cultures, um, the, the one who is who holds on to, you know, kind of the stories of the past and connects them to the children or the youth of the future, right? Um, and it could be actual stories. It could just be history of the family, right? Um, I think of my mother, um, who is the, we call the, uh, the phone book of the family, right? You want someone to know, you want to spread some good news. You want to pass, you know, oh, my daughter was born. Oh, you know, my, my fifth grade daughter gave the graduation speech for her class, blah, 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 blah. You want to pass that to the rest of the family? You text my mother, right? You text my daughter's grandmother. She spreads it, right? She has everyone. She texts here, here, there, there. The information will be across the country in 30 minutes. You just give my mother the, you know. So they're the ones who are connecting, right? They're, they're the center of that spider web that I was talking about. Yes. Information comes in, information goes out. Um, but also, Nana also represents the idea of the elder who is just passing along the story. There's, there have been so many people in my life, not just grandmothers, I've had uncles, friends, strangers that I've maybe met for you know two hours, but they'll tell me a story and it just, it has resonated with me and I remember it to this day, right? That's what also, you know, Nana represents um, I'm not originally from, I live in North Carolina. I'm not originally from North Carolina. I'm from the Midwest up in Wisconsin. Um, so I don't, I didn't know what it was like to grow up, you know, doing work on tobacco farms. That's a, that's a Carolina thing. Yes. Um, but I remember, I vividly remember there's a man that I've, I've seen once. It was like a New Year's day, a New Year's Eve celebration. We were at a house party. It was like four or five years ago. Uh, he came. Uh, he was a, a, a migrant worker. He, you know, he would travel from farm to farm, picking tobacco leaves. Um, and he told a story about picking the, the tobacco leaves and how he struggled his first time. I've never seen that man again. I don't even remember his name. He was a friend of a friend of a friend. But that story that he told has stuck with me all of these years because of how important it was to him and what it represent, what it represented for the kind of the global migrant, you know, workforce, how they're treated versus how much value they bring to the world that we live in today. Um, so that's what Nana represents. She is that, that elder storyteller that passes along stories of the past. Um, and even, you know, in, in parts of the book, when we talk about who uh, John Henry was, um, even correct some of our assumptions of what we've learned in the past about a historical event or a person um, giving us what she remembers as someone who has those lived experiences. Fascinating. Well, uh, Nana is in close competition with Gum Baby now to be my favorite character. <laughs> <laughs> I also, so bear with me about this question. It's a longish sort of question, but um, what I wanted to ask you was that um, the power of stories is what carries a twist and strong punch as a hole in the sky forward. But, um, but there are also these questions that you don't talk about. Um, there are these hidden questions. Um, for example, when it comes to the uh, bone ships, which represent the slave ships, of course, um, you don't, uh, and also the creatures and the people who are trapped in the ships, almost as though they're part of the ship and the middle passages, they are all horrifying to read. Um, so Tristan Strong has these stories that it alludes to, it shares glimpses of, and you know, stories in the shadows. You don't delve deeper and into detail with these stories of slavery and all the horrors associated with it. So I was wondering in the, this time of stories being suppressed and sometimes being banned, um, was this deliberate on your part? Did you perhaps want to encourage your readers to find out for themselves more about these hidden horrific stories or uh, was there something else going on? It was absolutely not deliberate. I am, um, I am fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the, a ban or topics that aren't discussed is the last thing that I'm thinking of when I'm writing a story. Um, in this case, <laughs> the simplest, the, the, the simple and straightforward answer is 
time. Um, this book right now uh, is 496 pages. It is 104,000 words. Um, and it's a middle grade book. Uh, and so there, there were so many moments where I could have been like, this could be a story. This could be a story. This could be, you know, um, an offshoot or, or something like that. Um, but we just didn't have the, the, in order to keep the focus on Tristan and his character growth art, um, we just didn't have the time or the space to address it. However, there are, there are, um, I like to call them either, uh, um, diving boards or, uh, seeds, depending on, on the analogy I'm using that day. And basically they are little nuggets within the book that, um, you can either, if you're interested, you can springboard off of those and research them because you're interested in, in what is happening, right? What is the mafia? Um, what were the cargo holds of uh, the slave ships, right? What was the, the middle passage? Um, what, uh, what drove it? How does cotton relate to it um, as, link, as a linkage, right? Um, so you can dive off and do that research on your own. The other thing is that when I call them seeds is that you don't even realize that um, you've, you've read it, but you just think it's part of a story. And then you're doing something in a social studies class or in a history class or something. And you read something and you make the, all of a sudden that seed blooms. You're like, I read about this somewhere, you know, and that connection um, that linkage that is made becomes even stronger and, and, and retained um, in a mind because we can lecture about history, right? Um, but what I found to be for myself and, and, and observing others, others, what I found to be more uh, powerful is rather than telling someone to learn about something, when someone goes off and learns about something on their own, they're more likely to retain that information. Um, so when, if I, if I could lecture to you at you for seven chapters about the horrors of a slave ship, right. But if you make that connection, and some people don't make that connection, but for the people who do, it is that connection is made even stronger, um, because of the fact that they went off and researched it or learned about it on their own and made that connection from a work of fiction to an actual historical atrocity, um, and that's just the way I like to write my books. I love to write my books. The story comes first, but that doesn't mean we can't sprinkle information along with it so that you're going to learn something as you entertain yourself. Thank you. Uh, it's fascinating to hear how you spin your stories and, you know, and they act as a sounding board. It showed it for me and for many of our young readers who are there with us today. Um, so I also want to talk about the cover page. Um, it's amazing. It's dramatic. Eric Wilkerson is, has done a fabulous job and it has so many elements of the story in it. The fiery sky, the fetterlings and the boxing gloves and the adinkras and John Henry with the hammer. But I always wondered why John Henry? Why not Gum Baby or Eddie's Journal? Or, you know, characters were so much in your face in the book. Did you have a say mm -hmm. in this or was it just Eric? No, no, actually. So what um, the way that Disney does um, its uh, covers is uh, they'll ask me, um, hey, is there a particular scene in the book that you feel like kind of represents the challenges and the story and the plot as a whole? something that um, really sets the tone for the story. Um, and, uh, and, and so the scene we picked is, or the scene I picked and that Eric then illustrated um, is the scene of Tristan and John Henry back to back defending the thicket from the iron monsters, right? Um, it's something that was really important to me is to have this black boy on the cover, right? Um, but to also to have a mentor figure behind him. And what it represents for me is this idea is that the children are always going to be the future, right? The children are always going to be the ones, the youth, they're going to be the ones sparking social change, really um, getting out there fearless um, and, and full of vigor and energy and fighting for their future. Whereas it's the role of, of the older figure behind him to support them to have their back, 
um, to shelter them if they need be, to give them a boost if they need be. And that's what John Henry does to Tristan. If we remember the scene, um, Tristan and John Henry fight together uh, during that scene. And it is John Henry's encouragement that re- and, and lending his power to Tristan that allows Tristan um, to defeat the iron monsters that he's facing. And so I thought that was a really powerful um, kind of summary of the story as a whole. And actually, um, if you flip over the book, and it's hard to see this because on the back we have all of the, um, you know, the summary, the description, but you see Eddie's journal there um, and the page the page is sort of flying off. Um, it's the, co- the full cover wrap is absolutely amazing. We just, you know, we cover it and blurbs and and you know awards and stuff like that but like eric absolutely knocked it out of the park yes he truly did and it's a fascinating story too thank you for telling us about the cover (laughs) (laughs) Uh, unfortunately are at the last question unfortunately so i just want to ask you this last thing um i see that um you have the graphic novel coming up in august um, and all the very best for that. Uh, could you tell us what do you have next in your kitty? Uh, are you planning to write some more stories involving African American gods or folk tales from other parts of Africa? What is next? So the next thing I so you know the graphic novel comes out in August. The sequel to Last Gate of the Emperor actually comes out in July. Um, but the next story that I'm writing that I'm behind on, don't, don't, don't tell my editor, um, is a story. I've always wanted to tell a story about um, really about um, Black wizards um, because we get a lot of stories about magic and how magic has been around for so long. Um, and you know different wizards from different cultures and even at a very young age i always you know whenever i would see these stories i was like all right so this takes place during this time what were um the black people who practiced magic what were they doing you know at this time where was you know was magic limited um did you know if did magic discriminate and so I wanted to tell a, um, a story about how magic developed um, from days of sharecropping all in, and related to a boy who is um, in a little bit of school trouble um, and discovers that he wasn't the first person in his family uh, to try and start over, to make a fresh start. Right. Um, So there's magic, there's trains, there's spirits. Um, It's all over the place. I hope it is as good as it exists in my mind. Um, But I love the I love the idea of being able to get power from the ancestors, you know, from the spirits that have come before. And this idea that, all right, if 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 my ancestors could help me, what power would that take? You know, um, how would that power take shape? specifically to my family, right? Like uh, a family of gardeners, right? They might have a pouch of seeds that is never empty and that can grow on instantly on whatever surface, right? Um, a family of porters who are traditionally, not traditionally, I shouldn't say that, but a, a career that um, uh, Black uh, Americans were able to enter and travel the country, you know, uh, what a family of porters, what would their magical power look like? Would it be the ability to summon railroad tracks and trains wherever they are in order to get to wherever they need to go? So it is a contemporary fantasy adventure with magic trains that I hope everyone loves. Wow. I mean, from what you said, that's just the rough idea and it already sounds so fascinating. <laughs> so we wish you all the very best for it. And uh, thank you, Kwame, again for sweep- speaking with us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Happy reading, everyone. Thank you.